Are you going to introduce us, John? Yes, I will. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. This is our last talk before lunch, so this is what's keeping you from an hour break. Um, we're not going to be quite as strict on time, but nonetheless, there it is. This is talk about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act by Oren Kerr and Marsha Hoffman. Hey there, good morning. Well, good afternoon at this point. Thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Marsha Hoffman. I am a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And um, I am really excited to have uh, Professor Oren Kerr with us today. Um, I think this is the first HackerCon he's ever been to. And he's super excited to be here. And I, I think it is to the benefit of all of us that he's here because he's an extremely um, uh, he's an extremely smart person who studied uh, computer crime laws for a really long time. He is one of the foremost experts on these laws in the, in, in the country, and um, it's a great it's a great privilege to have him with us. And I'm so I'm so glad he's here. Um, so when we first thought about doing a talk together, we were thinking, well, um, it'll be great to just talk about whatever's going on and is current and exciting. Uh, at the time ShmooCon comes up. And um, as it so happens, of course, there are some, some very big developments, um, uh, largely as a result of a very unfortunate thing, which is um, the suicide of Aaron Swartz. And so we thought, of course, this is what we should talk about. So we're going to talk today about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and um, some of the cases that have come up. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know me. I'm Marsha Hoffman, as I said. I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit, and we work for um, civil liberties online. Um, in addition to my work at EFF, I am a non-residential fellow at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, and I'm an adjunct professor at the University of California Hastings, which is a law school in San Francisco. And um, Oren? Do I introduce myself too? Yeah, introduce yourself. You do it better uh, than anyone else. I guess that's true. Uh, Oren Kerr, I'm a law professor at George Washington University. Uh, I graduated from law school in the mid-90s and then was a law clerk and then went to the Justice Department where I was in the computer crime and intellectual property section uh, for three years and then started teaching in 2001. Uh, since I started teaching in 2001, I've written a lot of law review articles on computer crime law, uh, represented some defendants in computer crime cases. Uh, one uh, case that got a lot of press attention was the Lori Drew prosecution, a woman who was prosecuted for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for being part of a group of people that created a fake MySpace profile, uh, which the government said was a crime. Uh, happily, we were able to get the charges dismissed on the ground that that was based on an unconstitutional reading of the statute. Uh, and then I've represented a couple other criminal defendants. Uh, and then I think along with uh, Marsha, I'm also going to be representing uh, uh, Andrew Arnheimer, a.k.a. Weave, uh, in his appeal before the Third Circuit coming up, and we're going to talk a little bit about that case. Uh, and with that, back to Marsha. Warren's going to be right back up in a second here. Um, I just wanted to say very briefly, this is what we're going to cover today. Um, Oren is going to talk a little bit about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is the federal anti-hacking statute, and um, some of the things that make it a little bit quirky and some of the things that make it pretty problematic so that we can kind of understand the scope of the problem that, that, that we're all dealing with here. And then we're going to talk about two recent cases, which are the prosecutions of Aaron Swartz and Andrew Auernheimer, and um, we're going to talk about the problems of the CFA in the context of those cases, and we'll also uh, naturally be talking about some of the CFA reform efforts that are, um, that are underway now uh, because those are things that are very naturally raised, especially by the Swartz case. So um, first and foremost, Oren is going to give us a little primer on the CFAA. All right. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about this law. It's called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, and it was enacted in the 1980s. Uh, in, it initially enacted in 1984, expanded in 19. 86, and as Congress likes to do, uh, expanded every two or three years since then until it became this kind of sprawling statute that has rather extraordinary coverage. Uh, the statute was enacted a year after the movie War Games came out, those of you that remember the Matthew Broderick movie, uh, and I think that had something to do with the timing. Members of Congress have no idea how computers work, but they can watch movies, uh, and when they saw Matthew Broderick almost start a global thermonuclear war, uh, they said, well, we've got to do something about that. Uh, so so they, they enacted the statute, and the idea of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is modeled after trespass and burglary statutes, traditional criminal laws, uh, which prohibit, if you think of what a trespass is, it's going into some space you're not permitted to go uh, without permission. 
uh, or staying there once somebody has told you to leave. That's sort of classic trespass. Uh, and then burglary is basically a trespass combined with an intent to commit a crime once you're in the place you're not supposed to be. Uh, and so Congress said, we, we, we like this idea of a trespass crime. Uh, let's, let's have a computer statute that deals with being uh, a trespasser into a computer. And, and so now the federal government and all 50 states have a form of this law, uh, an unauthorized access statute. Uh, and here's, here's a, a piece of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is perhaps the most important. The, the CFAA, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I'll be a lawyer and use the, the CFAA acronym, um, is, is based on a series of different crimes. So it's 1030A, uh, one through seven, it's seven different offenses, almost all of which use this common theme of unauthorized access to a computer, and then they build various components on top of that for different kinds of liability. Uh, and the broadest of the provisions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and the one that uh, uh, sort of is, I think, the most worrisome because it is so broad, uh, is Section 1030A2C. And this prohibits intentionally accessing a, a protected computer uh, either without authorization or in excess of authorization, and thereby obtaining information from any protected computer. Uh, so what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, it turns out any computer is a protected computer. Uh, uh, it, initially, the scope of the statute was pretty narrow. It was only designed to uh, deal with uh, federal interest computers, for example, U.S. government machines uh, or computers used by large companies that were interstate in nature. Uh, and over time, Congress has broadened this to include basically any computer under the uh, Commerce Clause, which it turns out as a matter of constitutional law, basically means any computer. And the definition of what a computer is is still the 1986 definition. And, and looking at the definition, boy, does, does, it, does its period show. Uh, so it's any uh, electronic, magnetic, optical, electrochemical, or other high-speed data processing device that performs any storage function and any storage facility, which I assume means a thumb drive standing alone. Um, but it does not include, in case you're worried, an automated typewriter or typesetter, a portable handheld calculator, or other similar device. And, and or other similar device means the people that were drafting this had no idea what they were doing, but figured let's just cover our bases and say anything like it. And who knows? Who knows what that? Uh, means. Uh, and so what makes the statute so broad is that there's really nothing in the statute about what authorization means. Here's really the core, the core idea here. So the analogy was to trespass, but what kind of trespass counts when you're figuring out what is an unauthorized access to a computer? Uh, and so the statute actually does not define authorization, and it has a, a statutory definition of exceeding authorized access. And, and the definition is completely circular. It just says you, you're exceeding authorized access if you have authorization and then you do something you're not entitled to do. That's just restating the question, right? It's just saying uh, ultimately the question is what's authorized. What is authorized, we don't really know. Uh, so we do know that Congress pri was primarily focused on the kind of Matthew Broderick uh, uh, hacking into a computer uh, problem. And, and I think Matthew Broderick actually hacks into computers in multiple movies. Not to typecast him as, as, as someone, but in fact, I think he hacks into a computer to change grades in at least two movies. Um, <laughs> he did it well the first time, so why not have him do it again? Uh, uh, and so the question is, what does exceeding authorized access or accessing a computer without authorization actually mean? And here are a couple different things it might mean. Uh, one, it might mean sort of breaking a technological access barrier. Uh, going past a password gate, for example, doing something uh, to block uh, and then tricking the machine, in a sense, to have it give you access. That might be what it means to be without authorization. Uh, and, but there are lots of other possible grounds uh, in which you could make an argument that access is not authorized. And an example of this would be terms of service. You might have a terms of service that says, you are only authorized to access this machine if uh, you are using this computer for official government reasons. Uh, if you are um, working, doing part of the official business of the company, you can, anyone who owns the machine can throw up some terms of service and say, um, you're only authorized under the following conditions. And, and it's at least a plausible argument, I think ultimately wrong, but a plausible argument that, well, wait a minute, that's the term, right? That's the no, no trespassing sign that says what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And if you break that condition, then you're really 
without authorization under the statute, and that's a crime too. At least that's a, a possible argument. Another possible grounds of saying that access is unauthorized would be just what if you're doing something that is kind of understood you're not supposed to do, and, and where this comes up most often is with employees who uh, they're working for a big company and they want to uh, leave the company uh, to start a competitor business or to go to a competitor business and help that new company. And so they look through their employer's network to try to find some good stuff that might help them uh, with the new business. And then the f they, they end up leaving the company, taking some of the information behind, uh, taking the info with them. And then the company says, hey, wait a minute, you were accessing our computer without authorization. Why? Well, it's understood that when we set up a computer, you're designed to use the computer to help us. And when you use the computer against our interests, you're no longer acting as our agent, and that's implicitly unauthorized. So that's what I, you can sort of think of as an agency approach to authorization, or what I've sometimes called a norms-based idea. It's just there's a social norm and understanding of what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do. Uh, and that's at least another possible ground for saying something is not authorized. And, I should say again, I don't like that theory. I think that's wrong too. But there's cases on all three of these. Everyone pretty much agrees that breaching the technological access barrier is access without authorization. And then there's just a lot of disagreement as to what to do with the terms of service cases and the employee who's accessing the network uh, with the intent to hurt the owner of the network. So there are a couple of other provisions of the statute uh, uh, that I wanted to briefly cover just to give you a feel for the overall scope of, of how the CFAA works. There's the unauthorized access prohibition, and its basic prohibition is a misdemeanor in Section 1030A2. Uh, but there are two other important sections of the statute, 1030A4 and A5, uh, which allow for felony liability. Uh, the idea of 1030A4 is it's an unauthorized access, again, that same concept, uh, designed to further a scheme to defraud. Uh, what is a scheme to defraud? Well, it's any uh, uh, sort of uh, means of obtaining property, uh, anything valuable through trickery or deceit. That's the basic idea. Uh, and then Section 1030A5 consists of actually a constellation of different prohibitions, but the first part of it is intentionally damaging somebody else's computer. Classic example, uh, denial of service attack, something like that. Um, and then also accessing a computer without authorization, again, that same idea, uh, uh, but then causing damage to the computer. And the question of how to measure the damage to a computer is kind of an interesting puzzle all its own, but what courts have said is, well, that basically means the amount of loss that's incurred to the owner of the machine, which typically ends up being calculated based on uh, how much time did they spend responding to the intrusion, how, what, what resources were put into that, and then they just say, okay, well, this employee spent X number of hours, and their typical rate for work is Y, and so let's multiply them and figure out a damage. It's, what I learned in sixth grade is rate times time equals distance, like the first formula I ever learned. Uh, and that's what they use to calculate the damage. And if it's more than $5,000 of damage, then it becomes a felony instead of a misdemeanor, uh, which basically mean, means a more serious offense. Okay, so speaking of more, more serious offenses, the, the basic idea behind the statute is for kind of the unauthorized access to be a misdemeanor violation. And a misdemeanor is, is defined by federal law as a crime that can lead to a maximum punishment in theory as a matter of what Congress has allowed of one year in prison. That's what it means in theory. In practice, a misdemeanor means a crime that is very, very likely to lead to probation. Uh, because for a couple reasons, prosecutors, federal prosecutors, don't like to prosecute misdemeanors. Uh, it's kind of the junior varsity uh, 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 crime to prosecute. They prefer to prosecute felonies. Felonies are crimes which are defined by federal law as crimes that can lead to one, more than one year in prison per violation. And, but you can think of them as kind of the kinds of crimes that lead to jail time. That's kind of the, uh, as a practical matter, the, what, how they're defined. Uh, and, and, um, the CFAA starts with misdemeanor violations. The basic unauthorized access prohibition is a misdemeanor. But then there are all sorts of felony triggers in the statute, sort of extra things that if they happen to make the crime instead of just a misdemeanor, a felony. Uh, and so some examples of them are intent to profit. If the unauthorized access was conducted with a design to uh, make a buck, uh, then that becomes a felony under Section 1030A2. Uh, if the information is uh, worth more than $5,000, if the information obtained is worth uh, a lot of money or at least 
up to five, more than $5,000, uh, then that becomes a felony. Uh, also, if there was intent to commit a crime uh, once inside the network, well, that's also grounds for raising the misdemeanor to a felony. And, and the analogy there is to burglary, just like trespass is a low-level offense. Burglary becomes a, a significant felony crime because of the intent to commit the crime inside. Uh, and then finally, if the uh, intrusion causes more than $5,000 of damage, uh, then that also can be grounds for raising the misdemeanor offense to the felony. The government can charge all of these different crimes. Uh, for example, in a particular offense, it might be one that is a, a Section 1030 A2 violation, A4 violation, and A5 violation. The government will file an indictment alleging all of these. And so you You'll you see this in a lot of criminal cases. Uh, there will be a press release that the defendant is facing, you know, 375 years in jail for 175 crimes, all of which happened on the same day. And you're thinking, how could that possibly be? Uh, and, well, it's, it's a little bit of uh, show that's going on. Uh, uh, the government is 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 uh, bringing forward a lot of charges, but as a practical matter. It's sentencing any one of these is all that controls. So once you get to sentencing, it actually doesn't matter typically whether a defendant was convicted of 10 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act violations or one. The sentencing all becomes the same. They just pick whichever one is the most significant offense under the, under the sentencing guidelines. So, so as a practical matter, CFAA violations <clears throat> usually lead to, if it's a misdemeanor, kind of just unauthorized access pro, uh, uh, probation. But if it's a felony, you know, you start talking about some amount of jail time up to a few years uh, in jail, just, just depending on the crime. All right, at this point, I'm going to switch over to Marsha. She's going to talk about uh, the Swartz case. Yep. So, how many of you have heard about this case? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have heard about the Auernheimer case? Okay. Wow. I'm surprised not more. Okay, so... So we all know about the Swartz case. Um, I'll go over the facts a little bit, at least what we know about it. Of course, this case never ended up going to trial, and um, so we never saw the government make its case. But we certainly have the indictment, um, and we certainly know some things that uh, friends and family members um, of Aaron Swartz have told the press. Um, so w what we know is this. So Aaron... Um, was uh, an, an activist and uh, a programmer and, uh, among other things, did work with a center at Harvard as a fellow. And um, he um, had access, uh, rightfully, he was, he was permitted to access, um, through his fellowship at Harvard, um, this, this service called JSTOR, which is basically an academic publisher. So it, it publishes um, academic articles and um, other academic literature. And uh, generally, uh, universities have some kind of a deal with JSTOR allowing access um, uh, for the university's uh, students and faculty and, and researchers so that they can, you know, they can have access to, this, to, the, to these articles. So um, Aaron uh, goes to the MIT campus and he starts to download um, articles from JSTOR. He writes a script so that he is downloading them very, very quickly. Um, he signs up for a guest account on the MIT network to do this. Um, he signs up with a, a, a pseudonymous name and um, provides some other information that's not traceable to him as a person. And um, he starts to download these articles. At some point, MIT notices that there's um, some, some heavy traffic going on. They don't like it. Um, and they try to um, block his IP address. And he circumvents the IP block. And at some point, uh, they try to block uh, the MAC address of his computer. And he uh, spoofs his MAC address and continues downloading. Um, at some point, JSTOR actually decides to cut off access to um, blocks of IP addresses associated with MIT in order to stop this activity. Um, so, you know, there's very much kind of this back and forth going on, uh, and Aaron is continuing to download these, these articles. Um, at some point, um, apparently, he goes into a closet where there are servers stored. Uh, there seems to be some dispute uh, about whether this was a locked closet or um, whether this was a closet he could just go into. But he wires directly into a server there and continues to download these articles. And um, at some point, the Secret Service gets involved here, 
and uh, they are seeing him go in and out of this closet on a surveillance camera, and they arrest him. And he gets charged uh, with uh, four crimes. Um, he's charged with violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, unauthorized access, um, and he's also charged with wire fraud. And um, he, uh, as, as the case goes on, there are efforts to, uh, you know, get him to uh, agree to plead guilty, and he um, will not do it. And eventually, there's a superseding indictment filed, and uh, 13 um, counts are made against him. Um, again, wire fraud and various um, violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I think they allege that he violated three different um, provisions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, all of which require unauthorized access as um, uh, and as a required element. Now, in terms of how much prison time he was facing, you know, there's been some dispute. The number uh, that, that we hear a lot is 35 years, and I've heard some uh, people, um, one former government uh, lawyer in particular, say that's really not realistic. He never would have been facing 35 years in prison, but um, that number comes from a Department of Justice press release that was issued when he was first indicted. So. Um, you know, since that number comes from the government, I think it's fair to use it. And so when he was looking at four counts, um, he, according to the government, was facing up to 35 years in prison. And after um, the charges got ratcheted up to 13 counts, um, I think we can safely say it was a lot more. And um, his trial was set for April. Um, he committed suicide last month. And so, of course, there will be no trial. So um, the situation with Aaron has provoked a lot of discussion about um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but also, I think, the larger justice system, and um, whether some of the tactics that prosecutors use um, in pursuing cases like this are really fair, whether something should be done so that such pressure can't be put on criminal defendants. Um, at EFF, you know, we've cared about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for some time, and um, we think that there are a lot of uh, things that perhaps contributed to his suicide. Uh, I think that's very fair to say. But um, our organization um, has been focusing on, on a couple of things. The first is pushing for reform of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, we are also, um, to honor Aaron's memory, going to be doing um, some, some work, uh, some more work in favor of open access. Uh, to, to information, particularly academic scholarship, and you'll be hearing more about that. Um, but maybe it's a very good time to talk about some of the uh, CFA reform proposals that have been floated. Um, I think there are basically three public proposals at this point. Oren has discussed some ideas for uh, updating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to uh, fix some of its more egregious problems. And um, EFF has worked uh, with uh, Jennifer Granick uh, at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society and the ACLU and some other um, nonprofit organizations and other people who are just interested in these issues to try to come up with something that, uh, that, is, that, that we can put forward. And I'll talk about that a little bit. And then, of course, Representative Zoe Lofgren has um, published a draft uh, piece of legislation called Aaron's Law that would fix some of these things, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And there are lots of other people who are doing some great reform work, too. Um, Christy Dudley here is in the front row, and she's been involved in a lot of this stuff, too, and Meredith Patterson's been great. Um, a lot of people um, interested in this, but um, let's talk about some of the reform ideas. Do you want to throw out yours, Oren? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, can I talk briefly about the sports? Of course. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to... Um, uh, talk a little bit about how the CFAA was applying to the Swartz case and, and the government's uh, theory in, in that case, and then we can talk about the reform proposals, I think because they're pretty closely linked. Yes. Um, so the first question uh, raised by the Swartz prosecution is, is what Swartz did an unauthorized access? Uh, and so, it, you know, I think the strongest case that the government has is that it was unauthorized to go into the closet and hardwire uh, to, to the machine of the university where he did not have, not only did not have uh, permission to use that machine, but uh, uh, it was not a university he was associated with. Uh, the counter argument is that MIT had a very open network, um, but MIT's policies were really clear, you can't go into our closets and hardwire to our, to our machine. So uh, I think it's tough to argue that that's not an unauthorized access to a computer. You can make a lot of arguments that it shouldn't be, that you should be allowed to go into somebody's closets uh, and hardwire to their machine, um, but I think under the current statute, it's kind of hard to argue uh, 
uh, that that isn't an, an unauthorized access. The closer cases there would be um, changing, spoofing the IP address, spoofing the MAC address. Um, it's a little bit tricky. We haven't had any CFAA prosecutions with the kind of cat and mouse game dynamic where the sysadmin is trying to block the user, the user is circumventing the sysadmin. The, the system administrator is not using sophisticated ways to try to block the user, but there is a sort of cat and mouse game between the two of them. Um, I tend to think that once you know the system administrator is trying to boot you off and you're coming up with ways of, of trying to get around the, the, the block, tough to argue again, I think, I think that's, that's an unauthorized access, but there's not clear case law on that one way or another. It, to, to my mind it is breaching a technological access barrier because the system administrator is actively trying to take you off the network, they're sort of trying to block you. But it's not a very effective means and one of the debates is whether the requirement for unauthorized access should be kind of effective means, some means of technological access barriers maybe should be recognized as triggering the statute and others should not. That's, that's one of the issues. But once you cross the unauthorized access threshold, you start looking at what are the different felony uh, triggers here. So the government charged uh, Swartz with 1030A2, A4, and A5. Those are the three crimes that I'd, that I'd mentioned. Under section 1030A2, uh, one of the ways of getting to felony liability is if the information to be obtained is worth more than $5,000. Uh, well, in the case of Swartz, it seems like he was trying to download uh, more than 5 million academic articles. Access to that database was being charged at a rate of up to around $50,000 per university. Uh, and the, the database was millions of, of articles of which to purchase a subscription would have been quite expensive. Clearly orders of magnitude more than $5,000 in value if you take the sort of question of valuing the information uh, based on a substitute of what you would have had to pay in order to get to that. There's, there's some case law as to how you measure the $5,000 and it suggests uh, uh, that, that, that a substitute of how much you would have to pay to get that information another way is a valid way of, of measuring it. So, so that was the case for the 1030A2 felony. Um, uh, in the case of damage, the uh, 1030A5 violation, we don't know a lot of facts as to how much time MIT or JSTOR spent in response to the intrusion. So we don't really know how to get to the $5,000, but probably they spent a lot of time uh, it sounds like from the, from the indictment and from some of the stories, they were spending a lot of time trying to figure this out uh, and, and responding to it. And if so, just the, the amount of time they spend thinking about it and working on it uh, ends up being time that gets counted towards the $5,000, uh, which is a very easy threshold to meet, right? So if, you know, if you're a security professional, how long does it take before you charge $5,000? I'm sure most of you are thinking, fortunately, not very long. <laughs> um, but, but that's the threshold for felony liability. So I think, you know, there's a lot of fair questions in the Swartz case as to prosecutorial discretion, uh, but at least based on the facts we believe are the case, we, we'll never know all the details because it didn't go to trial, so we didn't get to see both sides' uh, case, but at least based on what we know, uh, I think fair based on the statute as it exists today, uh, m perhaps an abuse of prosecutorial discretion, we can talk about that aspect of it, but at least on the elements, it sort of seems to line up to the elements, which then prompts the question of should we reform the, the statute in order to either make that not a crime or a less serious offense. Can I add one thing before Absolutely. before we get there? Um, another uh, just another fact that I think uh, is is worth considering is when you read the indictment, there is some mention made of the fact that JSTOR and the and MIT had some 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 rules or some sort of policy for uh, access to their networks, <clears throat> and that. Um, Aaron um, apparently, uh, according to the government, violated those. Now, it is unclear how much the government meant to rely on the violation of those rules um, as a, a basis for CFAA violation. Um, you know, certainly there was a lot more going on there um, in addition to, to any sorts of violations of, of any sort of policy or rules. Um, the, the other thing that um, complicates that is that this guy named Alex Stamos, who's a security professional who is going to testify as as an expert witness for Aaron, um, said that when he looked uh, at the MIT uh, network, it was extremely open, and in fact, there was no policy or um, terms of use or anything governing access to the system. So the facts uh, are very, very murky in terms of what, if any, uh, uh, contractual agreements or, or duties uh, Aaron may have possibly violated. But um, you know, I, I just want to mention that those are things that were mentioned in the indictment. Um, and I think that's important because a lot of the CFA reform discussion has been around 
um, making sure that uh, violations of contractual agreements aren't crimes. Okay, great. So, so th there are a couple different CFAA proposals on the books, and let me talk. I'll talk about mine. I love to talk about mine. Uh, so, uh, m my proposal would be first to limit unauthorized access violations to the breach of technological access barriers or circumvention of, of a technical block on on access. Uh, cutting out liability, eliminating any possibility of liability for breaching terms of service, for kind of doing something you're just understood you're not supposed to do. Uh, you know, those are interesting theories for a civil violation if somebody wants to sue you for breaching a contract. But I think it's pretty outrageous to say that these should be grounds for the government to be able to put people in jail. Uh, breaching a contract is not something that is normally uh, can lead to criminal liability. And not only that, the kind of written terms of service, nobody ever looks at them, uh, nobody's aware of them. They're written to be gobbledygook. I mean, the real reason why terms of service uh, exist, especially with, uh, you know, sites like, uh, you know, Facebook or Google or anything like that, the sort of big companies that, that we're visiting every day, uh, they exist to give the providers uh, a, a, a nice legal defense if they cut somebody's access and then the person sues them for cutting their access, says you, you violated my right to have a Facebook account or something like that. And Facebook can say, well, look at the terms of service. You breached the terms of service, so we don't have any duties to you. Uh, so it's lawyers that are writing this language, and that's why they're so damn long uh, and completely incomprehensible, in including to me. I can't make sense of them either. Uh, so it shouldn't be the case that that leads to liability. So my, my first proposal is to limit unauthorized access to the breach of technological access barriers. And, and, and exactly what unauthorized access means, I should say, is the subject right now of a disagreement uh, among the circuit courts of appeals, those are the federal courts just below the Supreme Court. Uh, and when there's disagreement in the courts of appeals, that means that uh, there's a good uh, possibility that the Supreme Court would be willing to review the disagreement and resolve it. Uh, so it might be that this question of what unauthorized access means will be going up to the Supreme Court in the next year or two and lead to a Supreme Court decision on how to interpret the current version of the statute. Uh, either way, I think the, the right reading is the narrow one that uh, some breach of a technological access barrier should be required to even get to misdemeanor violation under, under the statute. Uh, the next aspect of the proposals uh, that I put forward is that the uh, grounds for felony uh, in, uh, uh, liability should be much higher than they are now. Uh, so there are a couple things which I think are pretty offensive about uh, the, the current felony triggers under the statute. One is that if you have an unauthorized access in furtherance of any crime or tort under either federal or state law, then the misdemeanor becomes a felony. And the problem with this is that there are so many other federal crimes and so many possible grounds for tort liability. Tort liability is just kind of grounds for a lawsuit. Uh, uh, that's just all that, all that means. Uh, well, that means that the government can try to come up with lots of arguments for why all sorts of conduct is in furtherance of some other crime. And uh, prosecutors being creative types, they in fact have done that. Uh, in one case, United States versus Sioni, they argued, there, it turns out, you know, I mentioned there's at 1030A2, A4, A5, there's a lot of overlapping criminal liability. Uh, well, the, in that case, the prosecutors argued that one unauthorized access was in furtherance of one of the overlapping unauthorized access statutes, turning the misdemeanor magically into a felony. Uh, and fortunately, with the help of the FF, and I uh, advise on this case as well, the Fourth Circuit agreed that that was an impermissible reading of the statute, and you couldn't double count like that. Uh, not to be deterred, the Justice Department has now taken another view. So I mentioned that there are all 50 states have unauthorized access statutes as well. Well, in the Arnheimer case and in another uh, case in the same district, the federal government is taking the view that unauthorized access is always a felony because it's in furtherance of the state unauthorized access statute. Uh, so what they're trying to do is they're taking this language, which is, is unfortunately statutorily broad, it says any federal crime, uh, to double count uh, and to make everything a felony, which is just that. I don't think that's a correct reading of the statute because it has to be for lots of legal geek reasons I won't go into, that any, any, in furtherance of any federal crime has to mean unrelated to the unauthorized access or else it's completely circular. Uh, but that's the kind of problem we have in the current version of the statute. The thresholds to felony liability 
are just too broad. So the second part of my own proposal would be to cut back the felony enhancements so that felony crimes are the really serious offenses, misdemeanors are the low-level offenses, and there's an important line between the two. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned, DFF has been working with a, a bunch of folks to try to come up with a proposal as well. And basically, we agree with everything Oren says. We think all of his ideas are good ideas, and um, Congress ought to um, change the law to, to reflect them. Um, we have some additional ideas as well. We would go a little bit further. Um, for one thing, um, so as, as Oren mentioned, um, as, as a general matter, first-time offenses of the CFAA are misdemeanors, but they can become felonies um, in certain circumstances, like if they are committed uh, for the purpose of, uh, of what, $5,000 of financial gain, commercial advantage, and, um, or in, in furtherance of a, of a, of a, of a federal or state uh, crime or tort. So we think that that needs to be scaled back a little bit, and more first-time offenses ought to be misdemeanors. And um, what, we what we would suggest is that as a general matter, first-time offenses would be misdemeanors unless they are uh, performed for commercial advantage or private gain um, that's more than $10,000, or they're in furtherance of a federal felony, only a felony. And um, in that case, a first-time offense would be a felony, but otherwise, they would just be misdemeanors. Um, repeat offenses, of course, could be felonies. Um, and that leads to another proposal that we have. So as a general matter, repeat offenses are felonies. And um, uh, we have this concern that the law has been interpreted in a way where if you are charged with um, multiple counts of the CFAA, and as we've discussed, A2, A4, A A and A5 has some very duplicative overlap, um, we feel like uh, if you're going to be hit with those um, harsher penalties because you're a repeat offender, um, it needs to be a situation where you were convicted of, um, of a crime under the CFAA in one instance, and then because of unrelated conduct, you were um, convicted of another one, and that perhaps should, you know, be the basis for harsher penalties, but it shouldn't be the situation where you're a first-time offender, you've been charged with uh, multiple uh, CFAA counts based on, you know, one uh, episode of conduct, and then um, if you're convicted on the first count, then the others become repeat offenses. Um, and you can be punished more harshly for that. We think that that should not be possible. And so we would like the CFAA amended to reflect that. So I think those are basically our two competing proposals. Oh, something else that's very important about our proposal is that we think that the law needs to um, reflect that there are times when people have authorization to access certain information and um, they may perform technical workarounds to access that information in a way that might be um, sort of innovative or novel or not anticipated by um, the computer owner or by the, the, the uh, individual giving authorization to access the information. So there can be situations where technical measures are not um, actually uh, effective barriers to access, but basically sort of dictate the manner in which you access information. And we think that it should be okay under the CFA to circumvent those technical, uh, technological measures. Those shouldn't be considered barriers. So we th it, and that's a concept that we are actually uh, struggling a little bit to articulate. And if we could have help from all of you guys to do it, that would be fantastic. Because as it turns out, I think we've all learned that uh, trying to draft language uh, to make the CFAA better is a very challenging task. And um, a lot of us have been spending a lot of time on it, but we want to try to make sure that it protects the values that we want to protect, and it, you know, the law penalizes the behavior that shouldn't be protected. So um, articulating those lines uh, can be very challenging, and we really could use help <laughs> doing that. Should we talk about um, Aaron's law a little bit uh, as well, or do we, should we move on? Oh, no, we can talk about it. Sure. So there's a third proposal that's very publicly uh, being debated called Aaron's law. Um, this is a draft piece of legislation. It hasn't actually been introduced in Congress yet. Um, and it, it basically, it's being championed by uh, Representative Zoe Lofgren. And she's put up two versions, two draft versions of this language, and she's solicited public feedback. And um, it's possible that we'll see another draft before it's ever introduced. But um, the first draft of the proposal um, was basically meant to fix the terms of use problem that we've discussed. And it, it basically said, um, that uh, it, it shall not be a violation of the CFAA or the wire fraud law, which was uh, the other one that Aaron was charged under, 
uh, you know, simply to uh, breach terms of use or some sort of contractual uh, obligation or duty or policy. And then um, in her subsequent uh, version, she added uh, <clears throat> the idea that it shouldn't be, um, it, it shouldn't violate the CFAA uh, to uh, basically uh, circumvent some kind of a technological protection measure that's, that's um, based on your, on identifying you. Um, so basically, you know, simply um, making it impossible for a, a network owner to, to know who you are or, or sort of identify your computer should not in and of itself be a violation of the CFAA. So um, that's basically where that proposal is now. Should, should we talk Arnheimer? Let's do Arnheimer. Got to move on. To walk it back? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, it, th we're in Washington, right? We're, we're, oh, yeah, the, the question was, is there any precedent for Congress actually narrowing criminal laws instead of broadening them? Uh, <laughs> it, it happens once in a blue moon. I mean, we're, we're in Washington, right? And what, what does Congress do when there's a problem? Uh, pass a law. <laughs> to, 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 you know, pa pa the, other than Congress being the problem, let's just assume that they problem out there, you know, we'll pass a law, and if there's a law out there that already prohibits this, we'll pass another law, uh, and if there's a second law, we'll pass a third law, and if there are already tons of different laws on this, we'll make them more severe, uh, and we'll hope that that solves the problem. Uh, that's just sort of a common way, you know, for, for a politician to think about these things realistically, but uh, there's some precedent for Congress narrowing liability. It happens once in a while. Uh, there's a lot more precedent for the Supreme Court to construe statutes narrowly. There was a case called Skilling versus United States about two years ago, uh, interpreting the Honest Services Fraud Statute, which in some ways is a you know, ex incredibly expansive statute like the CFAA. Uh, they interpreted that narrowly uh, just two years ago. So there's there's hope. I, and, and actually, I, there's there's a tendency I think in this subject to kind of get depressed at how broad this law is and how bad things are. Well, actually. Things are a lot better now than they were about two years ago from the standpoint of the state of the law. Because two years ago, all of the courts had agreed with the really broad reading. Uh, and there were no circuit courts that had adopted the narrow reading. Uh, and so, for example, the, the first draft of Aaron's law was based on a 2011 proposal uh, from the Senate Judiciary Committee, which had said, okay, well, we agree that this CFAA means absolutely everything, but at least it doesn't mean just terms of service violations. And at the time, this was considered a big victory for civil liberties. Uh, well, now that's no longer the case. Now I would say we don't want that change because mm -hmm. based on where the courts are going, the, the courts are now interpreting the statute more narrowly. So the momentum is very much on our side. And I actually think the Supreme Court, if they got that case, would adopt the narrow approach. So, so actually there's a lot of room for optimism that things are moving in the right direction. It's, it's clearly tougher in Congress uh, uh, than it is, I think, in, in the Supreme Court. But you know, I'm hopeful that even there we might, might get some mm -hmm. law in the right direction. So, Thank you. so yeah, let's. Let's talk about the Weave case, and then we'll get to questions. And we'll try to do it quickly, because we'd really like to hear your thoughts on all of this. You want to? Sure. Go for it. Okay, so, so for this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit vague. And I have to be vague here, because um, uh, having recently signed on to represent uh, Arnheimer, I'm, I have to wear two hats. So I, you know, commenter uh, for you all, but also lawyer. Uh, so I need to be a little bit careful as to what I say. But here's the basic overview of, of what happened. Uh, this is involving AT&T's uh, servers. Uh, for, and in particular, AT&T AT came up with the idea of making email addresses available when you bought a new iPad. Uh, when you registered your iPad, you registered your email address, and AT&T thought it'd be kind of a nice, convenient idea uh, for, to, to program their servers such that when you visited the AT&T server with your new iPad, uh, it would automatically load up a URL that contained your unique identifier and then would give you back the email address that you'd registered with. So when you were going to log into your account with your username and with your email address and password, the uh, email address would be preloaded in there and you wouldn't have to enter it in. That was their idea. Uh, and uh, uh, Arnheimer and uh, uh, another individual named Spittler came up with the idea, or I guess Spittler originally came up with this. Uh, he realized that you could query AT&T servers with all these different ID 
uh, numbers in order to get back all of the email addresses of the uh, individuals that had purchased iPads. Uh, and they programmed a script in, uh, to, to, to do this, and they collected lots of email addresses and then uh, I guess released them to Gawker and it was, uh, uh, you know, sort of advertised that we hacked into at and server. Uh, the problem is that there was no hack into anything. It was information that was essentially publicly available if you knew which URL to enter into the URL line. Uh, it's just that it was in a place where you wouldn't normally think to look and you had to write a script to get all the different uh, email addresses to check the different numbers. Uh, and so the government's view was that this was unauthorized access into the AT&T server uh, because they sort of broke in and stole the email addresses. Uh, and that was their argument and they argued that this was a felony uh, 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 crime. First, unauthorized access because you weren't supposed to visit AT&T's <coughs> servers and get this information. Only the legitimate users were supposed to use this and visit that particular site. Uh, and then their argument is it's a felony for the reason we talked about a little bit uh, earlier that it's an unauthor federal unauthorized access in furtherance of a state unauthorized access violation, vi uh, violation in, furtherance of, uh, in furtherance of that crime and therefore a felony violation of the CFAA. Uh, Spittler uh, 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 agreed to testify for the government against uh, Arnheimer uh, and Arnheimer was convicted and sentencing is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, and on appeal, the arguments that we plan to be making were sort of naturally the arguments that were raised below. Uh, you know, w uh, actually, I can't say what arguments we will be making. I will say that natural arguments that could be raised uh, uh, on, on appeal uh, that should stand out to any rational human being who has observed the, the trial below uh, is, first of all, was this really an unauthorized access? It was essentially visiting a public web page. Uh, and AT&T made the decision once you visited that page, you would then get back a certain piece of information. It can't be a crime because that's out in the open. That's not breaking in. That's sort of seeing something that's out in the world. So that's one possible argument that could be made. Uh, and then the other is an argument that was made at the district court, which unfortunately the district court rejected, which is that you can't double count the misdemeanors into the felonies. Uh, so the arguments uh, are, are there. Again, well, who knows if they'll be made or not, uh, but they're, they're, uh, uh, that, those arguments could be made on the appeal, which would be happening in the next uh, year or so. So that's that. So thank you for your time and attention, and we'd love to hear any questions or thoughts that you have about any of this stuff. Matt Blaze. So, so Matt makes the point that <clears throat> I am. Sorry. Yes, I'm repeating the question. Marcia, so, do you want to repeat the question? Yes, I'll repeat the question. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, was there a question? No, just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, so Matt Blaze raises the point that um, basically no matter what changes we make to the law, we still have this problem of uh, prosec uh, prosecutorial discretion, and that's a big problem. And, um, you know, basically, you know, what are our thoughts on that? And um, my feeling is that, yes, it is a big problem. And it's something that's systemic to uh, the criminal justice system. This is not something that is specific to computer crimes. And it's not something that is specific to the CFAA. And it's not something that was specific to Aaron Swartz um, or to Weave. I mean, this is, this is something that criminal defendants deal with every day. And I think there are um, some, some, some great incentives for prosecutors to put a lot of pressure on the people that they're prosecuting. Um, because then they don't have to go to trial. Um, and I, I think that the incentives ought to be different. And um, I can say that there are some criminal justice organizations like um, the NACDL 
what does that even stand for, NACDL? National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. There we go, that are um, interested in what's going on here. And I, I know that there are some folks who are interested in thinking about more systematic ways to address this problem. And I, I agree with you 100%, it is a problem. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can make some changes to the CFAA, and that's gonna make some things better. But there are other things that need to be dealt with. But I think that they are bigger problems, and they're probably gonna take more time to deal with. And there's something that you know we've been dealing with for a long time now, right? Um, I would really like to hear what Oren, as a federal prosecutor, has to say about this, though. Former federal <laughs> prosecutor. I'm not doing that now. Um, so, yeah, there, there are, I think there are a couple pressures you have to understand to make sense of how the prosecutors are, are going about these cases. And one aspect of this is that these are federal cases. And um, in the federal cases, the federal prosecutors tend to bring felony crimes, not misdemeanors. So there's the state criminal justice system, which is uh, you know, your street crimes, your low-level offenses, your serious felonies, but like you know, traditional physical world offenses, burglaries and robberies and rapes and murders, those are typically state cases. And then the federal government deals with typically the interstate kind of issues, so wire fraud, which is fraud across state lines, and sort of white-collar offenses. Uh, and so for federal prosecutors to get involved, usually they only get involved if it's a pretty serious offense. And what's tricky is that computer crimes tend to be interstate crimes. Computer intrusion cases, not, not all of them, but almost all of them, a great majority, involve collecting evidence across state lines or even national lines. And the states don't have the authority to do that. So as a result, computer crimes tend to be investigated at the federal level. And, that, and they take a lot of prosecutorial resources, typically. There are a lot of court orders that have to be obtained, whereas in a typical street crime, there are no court orders. The lawyers don't get involved in street crime until the very end. Lawyers are involved in computer crime investigations from the beginning. Uh, and so that means that lawyers are invested in their time. It's federal prosecutors. It takes a lot of resources. By the time they catch someone, they want the prosecution to matter, in part because it's very difficult, candidly, for them to catch people. Uh, the, the rates at which they actually figure out who's behind uh, 1030 violations is very low. So when they catch someone, they've invested a lot of resources at the federal, federal level. Federal prosecutors, as I'd mentioned before, generally don't like to bring misdemeanors. It's sort of embarrassing to bring a misdemeanor crime. So they'll bring a felony indictment, and then they might take a plea to a low level, you know, I think the uh, first plea offer in the Swartz case that's been reported was three months in jail. That's kind of a level of jail time, which is equivalent to what might be the case for a misdemeanor in some jurisdictions. Um, but it was a felony indictment that was brought. So by the time the federal government has invested those resources and, and spent a lot of time on the case, you know, finally caught someone, there are a lot of pressures to bring the felony case, not a misdemeanor. And, and unfortunately, it's not totally clear how you could get around this problem. I think just as a as sort of a political economy of prosecution question. So you'd. To have a lot of low-level offenses, you need to be able to catch the low-level uh, offenses. And to have a sort of, you know, the more, more charges brought for misdemeanors, uh, you'd need to have the states be able to investigate those cases, to be able to collect evidence across state lines, for the federal government to have more access to evidence, uh, which would bring up all the privacy laws. You'd have to sort of change the privacy laws in order to give the federal government or state governments more power to investigate in order to then reduce the pressure to bring felony prosecutions. And so there's a trade-off there between privacy and the severity of charges when they're brought. And I think that explains why you get this system now that, that when federal charges are brought, they tend to be, to be felony charges. Now, I, I do think that the changes that we're suggesting to, to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act would be really important because by changing the threshold between misdemeanors and felonies, that would mean the federal government would not be able to charge felonies unless the facts were more serious. Uh, so as a result, they could do the investigation and they could catch the person in the end, assuming they do, and they would say, oh, well, this conduct is just a misdemeanor. So either we bring a misdemeanor prosecution or nothing. And they wouldn't have the discretion to bring the felony and then drop it down to sort of an equivalent misdemeanor pursuant to a plea. But that's some of the pressures that are on the prosecutors. Uh, in the back, there was a hand up for a while. Oh, yeah, in the back, sorry. <laughs> so the question is, how do you get, did you say 
How do you get industry experts in the same room as the lawyers and the politicians to fix the law? And when you say industry experts, I, I'm assuming you mean security industry experts, I'm hoping. I, I really think this is critically important in this particular legal debate. And the reason is because whatever fixes are made are going to affect this industry very directly. And we want to have a situation where security professionals can do good work and not be afraid of legal consequences that, that are, are completely overbearing and would otherwise chill um, socially valuable research that you all would, would otherwise be doing. Um, we want to punish the bad stuff, but we want to enable the good stuff. And striking the right balance is something that we can't do without your help. And understanding the consequences, the consequences of the various legal proposals is something that we can't do without your help. And so um, for all of you out there who are interested in this, you know, by all means, please get in touch with us because we would love to hear your thoughts. And um, you know, my email address is, in fact, if you want to hit the next slide, Oren, my email address is marcia, M-A-R-C-I-A, at EFF.org. Um, I, would, I would love to hear from all of you because I think it's, it's critically important to get everybody involved. This needs to be a big, a big push and it needs to be a big cooperative effort. Oh, and I should add that our email addresses were revealed based on our own consent. Yes. There was no hacking into it. There was no hacking server. involved. So you feel free to use those uh, emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, the U.S. is taking the lead on unauthorized access statutes, and all, um, I think there's something now, 50 or 60 or 70 countries now have unauthorized access statutes that are modeled off of the U.S. statute. They're all struggling with the same questions of how to interpret them, uh, uh, so, so it's the same problem, same technical problem, same trespass concept. Uh, and the uh, Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention requires the signatories to the convention to have some kind of an unauthorized access uh, uh, statute. So, so it's an international problem. Every country is kind of grappling with the same issue. But uh, there, are, there are more cases in the U.S. than there are in other jurisdictions that I know of. So we're all, we're all trying to figure it out uh, kind of at the same time. Over there. So basically the question is, um, are there any cases out there in which companies are prosecuted under a theory like criminal negligence or something else, basically because their security is really awful? Yeah. Yep, that's the question. Are you aware of any? No, I mean, there aren't, there aren't any criminal violations that would seem to apply. It's very rare for, for laws to criminally punish negligence. Usually for criminal punishment, you need to act knowingly or at least recklessly, usually intentionally. Like all the CFAA violations are intentionally accessing without authorization. Um, so so there, there are proposals to make companies civilly liable. And in the case of a corporation, the difference between a criminal prosecution of a corporation and a civil uh, 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 claim isn't really that much of a, a, a big difference because it's not like they put the corporation in jail. But, um, but there are a lot of proposals for civil liability, but I haven't seen any for criminal. Yes? That's a really good question. So basically what you're asking is, um, um, is so companies may tend to overspend on um, um, responding to a, a security incident or slip other things into that, basically sort of pad the number, which could have consequences uh, in a CFAA prosecution or in a CFAA case. Um, and you know, perhaps in calculating the amount of loss that the company suffers or, uh, or what have you. Um, and I, I think that that's a big problem. Um, the case law tends to suggest that too. Yeah, this is actually an issue that's come up in cases, yeah. and Congress um, 
to its credit, actually kind of responded to this issue. So it came up in a case called United States versus Middleton back in 2000, uh, in which the defendant argued that they, the victim had not really gotten to $5,000 because they spent way too much time responding to the intrusion. Uh, and the court said that you have to only count reasonable costs. Uh, so it can't be padded costs. And there have been a, there's a bunch of civil case law where this comes up. So the CFAA has a civil component as well as a criminal component. And this is usually happening in business to business litigation where one company will say, well, you know, we had expenses because uh, our executives had to fly to New York to have a meeting to figure out what to do in response. And the court said, you can't, can't count that. That's, to that. that's not about the computer intrusion. That's about kind of your PR problem. You can't count that. And then the, the amount of time spent has to be scrutinized for reasonableness. So if you're a defense attorney, you're in the sort of odd position of arguing that the victim was not acting reasonably in response. In fact, it can be even in good faith. Let's say there's a, someone who just overreacts to the problem. You can say, well, a reasonable reaction would have been much lesser, and therefore there's lesser damage. But this issue tends to be litigated mostly at sentencing, and at sentencing, there is not, usually the judge will just say, oh, I think it's in this range, and they'll just announce it without giving a whole lot of thought to the methodology. But there, there actually is, uh, the law actually does recognize that problem. For what it's worth, I saw a case in the last year or so in which a company who was suing a competitor uh, for CFAA violations argued that the cost of having to hire lawyers to litigate the case went toward loss. And um, while the judge in that case never really delved into that, he accepted their, their assessment of loss. So. I'm glad you think that's wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have, I, are, are we out of time or do we have one more minute? Maybe one more question and of course we'll be around. So, yes, you? I think we're out of time. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you have fun? Yeah.